I've mentioned already that we're going to imagine that the price is going to revert and end up at a particular point, what we're going to call the equilibrium price. And the quantity is going to settle down towards a particular quantity in the market. That will be called the equilibrium quantity. And so we want to think about how does that equilibrium price and quantity actually get determined? Where does that come from? All right, the first next bullet point suggests that both the profit maximizing on the part of firms and utility maximizing behavior on the part of the consumers, that's what's going to cause the tendency to move to equilibrium prices and quantities. And, and where is that equilibrium going to be? It's going to be at the intersection of supply and demand, of course. All right. So what we need to do is to talk about why, kind of what happens in the market that causes the price to adjust and to become the price that will equalize supply and demand in the marketplace. Right. So to tell that story, I'm going to tell a couple of what I what I call equilibrium stories. And an equilibrium story is just a description of the adjustment process to an equilibrium. All right. And there are two versions of the story. OK, we're going to we're going to talk first about what happens if the price is too low to be an equilibrium price. That that is we're at a price below the intersection of supply and demand. And then second, we're going to ask what if the price is too high in the market? And we're going to think about well, what would have to happen in order for the price and quantity to adjust to the point where supply and demand are equal to each other. So let's tell the stories. OK, the first equilibrium story, price too low story. OK, here's how we start out. We start out with a price. Again, the equilibrium is here where supply and demand are equal to each other. But we're going to imagine we're starting out with a price of PL is equal to 10. OK, the price is too low for the equilibrium. All right, well, what happens? The first thing that would happen is if the price were steady at a price of 10 for a period of time, the quantity demanded in the marketplace can be read off of the demand curve. And that's going to be equal to 30 units. So quantity demanded is going to be 30 at the price of 10. But the quantity supplied in the market is only going to reach a level of 10. Read it off the supply curve here. Take the price over to the supply, carry it down. We get a value of 10. So the quantity demanded is 30. The quantity supplied is 10. Therefore, there is excess demand. 30 minus 10 of 20 million pounds of, uh, of coffee here, let's say. OK, so there's excess demand. Now, the excess demand cannot be satisfied. Excess demand is, it means that people want to buy the product at the price of $10. But there's nobody selling it because the 10 million pounds were already sold and 20 million pounds are being demanded but are simply not available in the marketplace. Okay, we're going to think about artificially constructed situations like this that can come about because of price controls a little bit later. But here we're talking about no interventions causing this excess demand. And we're going to ask, well, what would happen in a market if there was excess demand? Now, here, we need to kind of wave our hands a little bit because we don't, this is actually a place where economists don't have a really good story to tell. And, and here's why. Remember that in a perfectly competitive market, we have individual firms, each of which are too small to take, to, to set the price, right? They have to take the price as given. Okay, and that means that no individual firm is actually setting their price. They're taking the price from the marketplace. But then we have to ask, if we've got these thousands and thousands of firms all taking the price from the marketplace, well, where is that market? And who's actually determining what that price should be? Well, we don't have a real good story except to sort of imagine that that's going to kind of work its way out in a real world situation. And here's a couple of ways of thinking about it. One way of thinking about it is to imagine that the supply and demand are kind of monitored and kept track of by an auctioneer. Somebody's going to sell off a bunch of wheat, for example, or a bunch of coffee. And the auctioneer is the person that sits in the marketplace and kind of is judging, making judgments about, well, who's willing to supply a product? What prices are they willing to supply it at? Who's willing to demand a product at what prices? And what the auctioneer does is they adjust the price in the marketplace, we'll imagine. So it's not being determined by a firm. It's being pro provided by an auctioneer. I, I don't have another name for that. OK, and what they're going to do is they're going to recognize that at a particular point, at this point in the story, 
that at the price of 10, if they announce a price of 10 and they say, okay, who's willing to buy this product at a price of 10? Then a bunch of people rise up and they say, we're willing to buy 30 million pounds. And at the same time, they ask the sellers, how much is willing to be supplied at a price of 10? And they announce, well, only 10 million pounds. Okay, and so the auctioneer says, oh, well, that's not going to match. We've got a much, bunch of excess demand, so what should I do? The auctioneer decides to raise up the price, all right? And if they do that, a couple of things are going to happen. The most immediate effect is going to be the increase in price is going to make the demand for the product fall. You're going to move along the demand curve, in other words, because higher prices are going to reduce the demand by individual consumers. All right, so as you raise the price from 10 to 12 to 15 to 18, demand is going to be choked off pretty quickly. What's a little bit more harder to tell in the real world story is how supply adjusts, because the supply function is upward sloping here, meaning that as the auctioneer raises the price, they're going to get an increased supply of the product to the marketplace. That's kind of like saying firms are going to hold back certain amount if the price is too low, but if it rises, they're going to instantaneously produce more and supply more to the marketplace. Now, that's a little bit hard to accept because firms presumably should take time to raise and lower their supplies. I mean, if they're going to raise their supply from 10 million pounds to 20 million pounds of coffee, for example, that might take a whole season or even a couple of years in order to make a big increase in coffee supply of that particular amount. Right, so supply in the real world can be reasonably thought of as taking time to adjust, but we're going to ignore that complication and we're going to imagine that producers just instantaneously respond to changes in prices by changing their supply. Again, this is where modeling gets us kind of bogged down sometimes because we make simplifying assumptions in the model. And then we try to match it to the reality that's out there and discover that, well, it doesn't really match perfectly in this particular case. All right. And so we have to sort of fudge a, a story in order to have it make some sense in the context of the model. Now, we could get out of that by making the model much more realistic. But if we made it a lot more realistic, it becomes a lot harder to work with and understand. So there's this choice of... Should we keep the story simple so that we can work with it, or should we complicate it so much that it makes it unworkable? And that's sort of where we fall in this particular area. Now, there's one other point I want to make here, and I, I like this story as being a little bit more convincing, perhaps. We can think of the auctioneer as being kind of the retailer of a particular product. You know, coffee is sold to most consumers in a grocery store, for example. And the grocery store is sort of that middleman person, that intermediary that's determining and, mark and monitoring what's the supply and what's the demand at different prices that get set. And if there's a situation where the price is low and the demand is ex there's excess demand of a considerable amount, what the retailer is going to notice is that inventories of a particular product are going to fall. You know, so at a grocery store, they're stocking the shelves every day, right? Well, let's say they're stocking the shelves for a particular type of coffee, and every day they go there and it's like it's completely sold out. And so they realize there seems to be a lot of consumer demand for this particular product. So what would they do? They might call the coffee supplier and say, hey, there's a lot of demand for your product. Could you ship us more? Instead of the, you know, the, the case that you're sending us each week, send us two cases instead. And the coffee producers might respond as such. But at the same time, they're going to realize, hey, we could make more money if we raised up the price because there's excess demand for the product. So the retailer becomes like the auctioneer. They recognize that inventories are falling, that the stockpiling of this good is it's disappearing faster than expected. And so they respond by raising up the price of the coffee because they'll make more money as the intermediary too. And they can get more supply of the product to come in because of the higher price. They're going to choke off some demand, but that's okay because there's excess demand for the product as it is. So the retailer raises the price in response to a drop in inventories, and they keep doing that until the supply and demand of the product just matches each other. So they get it up to a price of 20, and once the price gets up to 20, well, the amount that 
suppliers are willing to supply is exactly equal to the amount that demanders are willing to demand. And you've got a very regular cycle. You get a case of coffee in at the beginning of the week, you put it on the shelf, by the end of the week it's gone, and you get a new case that comes in. And then you keep selling the product at that particular price and you have reached the equilibrium. Okay, so that's kind of a background story for what you would do if the price is too low. Let's tell it again, and I'll tell it quicker this time, um, without so much background material. Suppose the price is too high. So suppose instead that this retailer, I'm going to stick with the retailer story now. The retailer has a price of $30 per pound of coffee, and they've discovered that at the price of 30, that the quantity demanded is only 10 units. 10 million pounds, but that the quantity supplied is much higher. So the retailer is basically telling the suppliers, hey, we got a price of 30, how much are you willing to supply? They're saying, oh, $30 a pound, we'll supply 30 million pounds, that's great. But what they discover is that at a price of 30, it's, it's too much. Too much supply, there's excess supply of 20 million pounds of coffee. And what that's gonna lead to here from the retailer's perspective is a buildup of inventory. So they price, set the price at $30 a pound and they realize, oh, well, you know, they sent us a case every week, but we have leftover coffee on the shelves at the end of each week. And then we get another case and then we got even more coffee. So it's piling up and we've just got too much coffee at that particular price. So the retailer responds by lowering the price. And in doing so, it cuts back the supply by the individual coffee producers who are not getting as much for their product and it raises the demand by lowering the price of coffee and they'll continue to lower it until the price is equal to twenty dollars and we're at this nice equilibrium at the middle of supply and demand all right so that's kind of what's going on in the background to adjust to an equilibrium when there's a particular change 